Welcome to the Museum of the Jewish People at Bet HaTfutzot. Here, we believe and try to tell the unique and ongoing story of the Jewish people. We believe that you are part of the stories. The Zabludov Synagogue was built using only wood, without any nails or any other sort of metal. This synagogue has a beautiful folklore story attached to it, showing us the importance of synagogues to Jewish communities throughout history. It is told at one time a fire started in the synagogue and a flock of birds came from all the woods around it to quell down the fire. This beautiful reconstructed ceiling is of the Chodorov synagogue in the Ukraine. At the center we see a two-headed eagle which symbolizes both the Austro-Hungarian Empire and also the Jewish God. Around it we see the zodiac, and around the zodiac, the symbol for time, we see a myriad symbols of folklore, both Polish and Jewish, conveying how no Jewish community lives in a bubble, and we're all constantly interfacing with the cultures around us, taking and giving back to them. On the bottom tier, we have pictures of animals from lands far, far away. This ceiling, painted during the 18th century, wanted to show that the Jews of this community knew what was going on in the outside world. And so we have their view of the world, God, time, the community, and then the outside world. Welcome to the Hallelujah Gallery, Assemble, Pray, Study. In this gallery, we display dozens of synagogues from around the world, from different times in history. We see that the synagogue is not just a place of worship, or a place that deals with a personal connection to God. It is also a place that connects people. A synagogue shows how a community builds itself, and how they choose to display themselves to the outside world. Looking back, we are able to learn a lot about a community by studying the structure of the synagogue, its interior, and the different parts of the synagogue. Dureropus is a second century synagogue located in what is today the borderline between Syria and Iraq. Back then it was the borderline between the major empires of the time, the Roman Hellenistic Empire to the west and the Persian Empire to the east. In this beautiful mural we see something that we don't usually associate with synagogues. We see painting, we see color, and we see a lot of human figures. But actually this is very much a synagogue. And we can see that with the fact that all of the different stories are stories taken from Hebrew scripture. And so, for example, the story of the birth of Moses is here, along with Exodus and Moses in the burning bush. Other stories concerning biblical figures like Elijah, King David and Jacob, and holidays like Purim. This beautiful synagogue shows us the importance of Jewish memory. Built in the 18th century in the Caribbean, it's a beautiful, luxurious building built by a thriving 
educated community of rich merchants who came from Amsterdam, but are originally from Spain and Portugal. After being expelled from there more than 250 years before the establishment of this synagogue, they wandered the earth until coming to the Caribbeans and establishing this community. Here, they build a lavish synagogue, but at the floor of the synagogue is sand. The sand is there to remind them of two distinct Jewish communal memories. One is of their forefathers in Spain and Portugal, the Moranos, Anusim, Jews who lived as Christians, but actually underground lived Jewish life. And in order to do a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah, to read the Torah or perform a Jewish wedding, they would have to go down to the basement or up into the attic. To avoid prying ears, they would put sand on the floor so that the Inquisition wouldn't know what they're doing in the middle of the night. Another memory they want to conserve is a memory that all of us have in common, the memory of Exodus and of wandering in the desert. And that is how we see a Jewish story, a Jewish memory, coded into the very fabric of a modern building. There is perhaps no better example of the museum for the complexity of Jewish life than the German synagogue in Venice, which was established already after the establishment of the ghetto in the Italian city. In 1521, the Venetian Senate, afraid of the rising class of Jewish merchants at the city, devises a plan to have a ghetto where they will keep all the Jews during the night with many restrictions. But even with all of these restrictions, Jews kept coming to Venice because it was a city where they had more privileges than other places where they could perhaps be a doctor, a merchant, a lawyer, a businessman. And so we see Jews coming from Germany here and establishing a synagogue. Alas, they could not establish a synagogue that could be seen. It was forbidden to build new synagogues. And so they took an old building in the ghetto and they refurbished the top two floors to make a lavish and beautiful synagogue. This disparity between what is inside and outside is perhaps a very fitting metaphor for being a Jew throughout times, but especially at modern times. One of the most important models we have at the synagogue gallery is the Tlumatska, the great synagogue of Warsaw, Poland. The synagogue, opened in 1878, was the largest synagogue at the time in the largest Jewish metropolis, Warsaw. It served the elite of the community, those Polish and German Jews enjoying emancipation, becoming doctors, bankers, lawyers, and whatever they could with the newfound rights they had. The synagogue could hold thousands of people, but this was still just a minority of the community, those who could afford the seats. This raised some protest in the Jewish community of the time, and during the high holidays, there were several back benches that were saved for those of less means. The community thrived until 1939. With the invasion of Nazi Germany, the rabbi of the community, Senator Professor Rabbi Moses Shore, realizes where the tide is heading, and he starts bearing artifacts from the synagogue on synagogue grounds. Through his diplomatic connections, he manages to sell several of the artifacts to a Swedish family. In May of 1943, following the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt, the German army comes to the synagogue and destroys it completely. It wasn't in the ghetto, but it was a, but it was a symbol of Judaism for them. And so they wanted to show what happens if you revolt against the Nazis. 20 years later, the young Israeli nations receive a phone call from Sweden. We have something we would like you to have. And that is how 
the menorah came to Israel. This menorah, one of a pair of menorahs that stood on each side of the ark, was saved by the rabbi, sent to Sweden, and finally rests here at the Museum of the Jewish People. The Toro Synagogue of Newport, Rhode Island, is the oldest synagogue in the U.S. today. Built in the 18th century, it was established by a Sephardic Jewish community, Jews who were expelled from Spain and Portugal 250 years before then. This is a beautiful synagogue built in the style of the time, but being fearful of something happening to them, underneath the bima there is a trap door leading to a secret chamber. Not long after the synagogue was built, their worst fears were realized. There was a revolution, and all of a sudden, they no longer lived in a colony and abided by the king's rules, but lived in a state and abided by the president's laws. George Washington wasn't just the first president of the United States, he was the first president ever. And so, in 1791, when as part of his tour of the states, he arrived at Rhode Island, this small community sends him a letter asking him and begging him to respect them and to let them continue and worship God in the way that they see fit. George Washington answer, answers this letter by saying, I cannot grant you that which is not mine to give. Here in the United States, he explains, there is religious freedom. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> 